you please find your seats? Right. And he's got the door. Solid. All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet Second Class Ethan Thomas. Uh, it is my privilege to welcome you to this session of the 23rd Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium made possible by our flagship supporter, the Class of 73, the Association of Graduates, and the USAF Endowment, and many generous supporters. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. So, Mr. Wes O'Donnell is a professor of applied leadership, predictive and analytics, and professional speaking at Baker College in Michigan. He is also the founder of Warrior Lodge Media Group, the host of the upcoming Our American Legacy TV series, and the author of Rise, the Veterans Field Manual for Starting Your Own Business. Mr. O'Donnell is a veteran of both the U.S. Army Infantry and the U.S. Air Force Maintenance Career Field. He switched when he found out the food was better. Uh, he loves motivational speaking so much, he just might do it full time. And ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to present to you Mr. O'Donnell. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Anytime, sir. The floor okay. is yours. All right. How's everybody doing? Good. Good? A little sleepy after lunch? Try and get you guys motivated. That's what I do. I try and motivate people. Uh, I'm going to show you guys uh, why the profession of arms uh, really helps out so much in the civilian world after you get out. So as I was introduced, um, I own a business called Warrior Lodge Media Group. Uh, what wasn't mentioned, and I sort of fell into this recently, I'm, I'm now a documentary filmmaker, so we're working on a movie called The Forgotten about the Vietnam era veterans. And uh, not necessarily their service during the war, but the Vietnam veterans, uh, how they responded when they came home, how they were treated, especially in contrast to the current crop of post 9-11 veterans. Definitely a huge difference. So I ran into a friend in the hallway and she said, Wes, why do you always start your talks with a joke? And I said, well, laughter brings a room together, creates a different energy, it wakes people up. When I start with a joke, I can see this beam of light envelop the room and connect at the back. And we're all on the same page after that. So you guys ready? All right. A military pilot called for a priority landing because a single-engine Falcon was running a bit peaked. Tower said, negative Falcon, you're number two behind a B-52 that has one engine shut down. Fighter pilot said, ah yes, the dreaded seven-engine approach. <laughs> now that joke will only work here at the Academy. It's very difficult to make that joke work anywhere else. So clearly, I'm not a stand-up comedian. Why am I really here? Anyone can start something, but very few people finish. You, my friends, are finishers. You see, I know something about you, even not knowing you. I know that you have greatness inside you. Based on my experience, I've come to the conclusion that because of your relationship with the profession of arms, you are much more likely to achieve your wildest dreams of success. The problem is that some of you don't know it yet. Yeah, but Wes, what if my dream is too big? <laughs> it's not. Trust me, it's not. Impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men. You see, someone in this room right now will be the first person to set foot on Mars. Someone in this room right now will be the CEO of your own Fortune 500 company that you start. Someone in this room right now will be President of the United States. There's a new generation of veterans the post 9-11 veterans. They're smart. Smarter than any generation that's come before. They're technologically advanced and in the next two decades they're going to be responsible for the largest economic boom in US history. Many of you will one day be veterans and more importantly many of you will soon be leading airmen and soldiers who will one day be veterans. I want to change your perception 
of success. And I want to give you the motivation to make this decade your decade. Welcome to the new American century. All right, so do me a favor. Turn to the person to your left or right, look them in the eye, shake their hand, and say, you've got the right stuff. Do that for me now, please. <laughs> All right, you got the right stuff. My mentor, Les Brown, told me that most of us go through life pretending that we don't have any goals or ambitions or desires, when really, deep down inside, we do really want more. We block ourselves and we use these words almost like we're in a trance, like we're sleepwalking through life that we find ways to cancel out our dreams. That a lot of things that we want to do, a lot of places we would like to go, a lot of things we would like to experience, and we just stop at but. But will cause you to hide out behind fear. But will cause you to come up with all types of excuses that you can validate your inaction and not acting on your dream. But is a dream killer. Most people, you know what they do? Most people go through life quietly and safely, tiptoeing to an early grave. We've been holding back. We have ideas that we don't act on, things we want to do, we're afraid to take chances. See, a lot of people say no to things, and they don't even know what they're saying no to. Don't allow but to keep you in the corner. There are a lot of people who say, but I tried once or twice and it didn't work out. And so they use that as an excuse not to ever come out again. Look, if things don't work out, if you don't produce the results you want, that's fine, but don't confuse who you are with the results that you produce. Do what you can, where you are with what you have, and never be satisfied. Don't get satisfied with yourself. Always know that wherever you are, that you can enjoy more, that you deserve more. Why don't you decide now that you're going to expand your world? That if other people can learn, you can learn too. See, if you're working on your dream, sure, there are going to be times when you're going to want to quit. Sure, there are going to be times when life will knock you down and catch you on the blind side. But the challenge is, is to hold on. And if you hold on tenaciously, I say the universe is on your side. See, if you don't make a decision to live your life, if you don't decide to step into your fears, if you don't decide to say yes to your life, it'll never work for you. You've got to live what's in you. Life is too short and unpredictable. Helen Keller once said, life is short and unpredictable. Eat your dessert first. But what do we say? What will always be tomorrow. You know, guarantees you're going to be here tomorrow? Always something there to build a case on why you can't move on, why you can't grow to the next level, why you can't begin to live life on your terms, why you can't begin to manifest your greatness, that you're going to say, it's not worth it? Yes, that's going to be right there for you. It's going to be in your face telling you to go back. So if there's something you've always wanted to do, take it head on. Life will never be the same again. So if there's something you've always wanted to do, the time for just wishing is past. Time for doing, that's the time right now. So let's define success. Let me tell you what society says you should do to be successful. Graduate high school. Go to college or join the military. Get a good job. Make sound financial decisions. Save for retirement, some sort of 401k. Retire and then die gracefully. But life can be so much more broad than what society tells you when you come to realize one simple truth. Everything you see around you was made up by people 
who were no smarter than you. Success could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but let me tell you my definition of success. Find that thing that makes you happy and then find someone to pay you to do that thing or do it well enough to pay yourself. I want you to look at your life right now and think about something that's important to you. Something that gives your life a sense of value. Think of something that you'd like to have or something that you'd like to create for your family or for society. Maybe there's something in your life that you talked yourself out of, convinced yourself that it wasn't possible. For whatever reason, whatever it was, bring it back out here. How are you going to do it? Don't worry about that right now. You'll become the type of person that can attract the resources and the people to help make it happen. The key here is deciding that you're going to do it. What gives your life a sense of fulfillment? A sense of joy? What does a full, rich life mean to you? What is it that you can love doing seven days a week that will bring a smile to your face? I've got bad news for some of you. If it's Monday and the only thing you look forward to is Friday, you're in the wrong job. Time to face yourself. Look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, what do I want to do? Success doesn't require that you look out the window. It only requires that you look in the mirror. Horace Mann said that we should be ashamed to die until we have made some major contribution to humankind. We're standing here in the U.S. Air Force Academy. We're talking about leadership. Leadership starts with you. But how are you going to lead anybody if you can't take charge of your own destiny? Reminds me of a story of a dog that was lying on a pile of wood and moaning and groaning and howling in pain. And this man walks up and says, hey, why is this dog moaning and groaning? And the owner says, well, he's sitting on a nail. And the guy goes, sitting on a nail? Why doesn't he get off? And the owner says, I guess it don't hurt bad enough. Raise your hand if you know somebody that moans and groans about their place in life, but doesn't do anything about it. Man, my job sucks. I hate my boss. He's so stupid. That was me. When I worked at a large German medical company that shall remain nameless, I came home from work and I told my wife, Wife, my boss is so stupid. And she said, Well, if he's so stupid, why is he the one signing your paycheck? And then it hit me. Imagine getting an idea in 360 degrees like a diamond bullet right between the eyes my boss runs a successful company I'm smarter than my boss I could run a more successful company and I'm lucky that I had that epiphany in my 30s that's still relatively young this is me at the time I had a six-figure salary beautiful wife Corvette beautiful house do I look happy in this photo, all of the material possessions in the world will not make you happy if you're not doing the job that you've been born to do, if you're not becoming the person that you've been born to be. I see this all the time. Stop living your life like you have a thousand years to live. What's the saying? Here today? Gone today. You need to make a mental decision to get started. A lot of people that were here yesterday aren't here today. A lot of opportunities that were here yesterday aren't here today. So why do most people wait? Or not act at all? So I'm working on my next book right now and I haven't announced it yet, but I'll give you guys a sneak peek. Over the past six months, I've interviewed 100 self-made millionaires to find out what made them successful. And what I discovered was that one word, certainty, made the difference between success and failure. 
When someone is absolutely certain about something or an outcome, when the end result is already a foregone conclusion in your mind, all that's left is the execution. The people that failed all had one thing in common. They weren't absolutely certain that if I do this, that I'm going to get that result. They had this wishy-washy, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but I'm going to give it the old college try. You have to have certainty that you're on the right path. You have to visualize the outcome. There's this well-known experiment by a doctor at the University of Chicago where he tested some basketball players on their ability to improve their free throw percentage. He divided the players into three groups. The first group, he had practice shooting free throws for 20 minutes a day. The second group, he had just closed their eyes and visualized themselves shooting the perfect free throw, hitting every basket perfectly. In the third group, he had to do nothing. The results were nothing short of amazing. The first group, the one that actually practiced, increased their free throw completion rate by 30%. And the group that did nothing but visualize shooting the perfect free throw increased their percentage by 29%. And as you would expect, the third group that didn't do either had no increase at all. You have to see the end result before it's a reality. You have to believe with absolute certainty that you are something that you're not before you are. Athletes do this all the time, but what about others? Well, I just spoke to a friend of mine who used to be an operator, and now he works for the DOD as a civilian, and he confirmed to me that, sure enough, before every sortie, he and his team would visualize the perfect execution and outcome when they were performing a hostage rescue. Navy pilots visualize the perfect carrier landing every time. You do this over and over in your head. You prime the brain, and the body follows with perfect execution. For me personally, when I worked on MRI machines, my first job after leaving the Air Force in 2007 was working on MRI machines. I used to bring two magazines to work, an Entrepreneur Magazine and an Auto Trader. And I used to look at these cars, mostly the Corvettes, Corvette Stingray, and I used to say, no later than three years from now, I'm going to be driving that brand new Corvette Stingray. I would see myself physically driving it. My imagination was so vivid. I could feel the hand-stitched leather. And my colleagues would laugh and they'd say, that's a $90,000 car. There's no way you're getting one of those on our salary. That's exactly right. That's where the Entrepreneur Magazine came in. I want to see what people are doing, doing that job that I want to do. This is my baby now. I call her the Queen Anne's Revenge, too, technically. The first one's at the bottom of the Atlantic. It works. You have to be certain of the outcome. And if you know what you want to do, how do you get started? Maybe your dream is too big. Just do a little bit of it. Devote a little time each day to working on your dream. I like what Robert Schuller says, By the yard is hard, but inch by inch... Anything is a cinch. But what if you don't know what it is you want to do yet? What if you know you're meant for greatness? You can feel it deep down inside you, scratching on the back of your brain. But you just haven't identified what that something is. Try everything. Let me ask you this. How many Mozarts or Beethovens has the world missed out on? because someone never sat down in front of a piano. How many Einsteins has the human species missed out on or lost to time because someone never picked up a physics book and went to work for the family business instead? You don't know what you don't know. Try everything. There's a minister named Miles Monroe that once said, the wealthiest place on earth is not the Middle East where they have oil in the ground. It's not South Africa where they have diamond mines. The wealthiest place on earth is the cemetery. 
Why? Because there lies all of the dreams and goals and million dollar ideas that people took with them to their graves. You have talents and skills inside you that you haven't even begun to reach for yet. And most people don't move on their dreams because they don't believe that it's possible for them. They aren't certain of the outcome. Before 1968, no human had ever run 100 meters in under 10 seconds. They called it the 10-second barrier. It can't be done. Human beings just aren't physically built for that level of speed. It's a physiological limitation of our species. Humans can't fly. We don't have wings. And even if we did, our pectoral muscles aren't strong enough to generate lift. It cannot be done. Then, in 1968, Jim Hines comes along and breaks the 10-second barrier. Barely. He did it in 9.95 seconds. Since then, 105 people have broken the 10-second barrier. Why? What changed? People saw Jim Hines break the 10-second barrier, and after that, it was no longer impossible in their minds for humans. Someone had done it. So in theory, anyone can do it. Sometimes we need to see the person doing that thing that we want to do. And that inspires us. All right, do me a favor. Turn to the person to your left or right. Look them in the eye, shake their hand, and say, you have no limits. Do that for me now, please. You have no limits. There are no limits. All right. That's right, no limits, except the ones we place on ourselves. So where do veterans come in? President Barack Obama is the 44th President of the United States. However, there have actually only been 43 men that have held the position, thanks to Grover Cleveland serving two non-consecutive terms. So out of 43 men, how many were veterans? The majority of U.S. presidents have been military veterans. 26 out of 43 presidents serve their nation. I would even go so far as to say that if you're a veteran, you have a better chance of being elected commander-in-chief than your civilian counterparts. Some of our best presidents have been veterans. Ronald Reagan, John F. Kennedy, Theo Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, and of course our very first president, George Washington. So what's stopping you? We need people with military experience leading this country. And my mission in life is to get more veterans into business and politics. We've seen it done in the past, so we know it's possible. Success-minded veterans are also largely responsible for the massive economic boom of the 1950s. In 1944, the GI Bill helped veterans returning home from World War II earn college degrees, train for vocations, support young families, purchase homes and farms, and most importantly, start their own businesses. My own grandfather, who was an ace fighter pilot for the Marine Corps in the Pacific, came home and opened a dry cleaners in Dallas, Texas. The most important part was that veterans were and are 50% more active in their communities and civic associations. In the 1950s and 60s, many veterans joined the civil rights movement to expand equal rights. If we're not all equal, they thought, then what the hell were we fighting for? But why? What qualities do veterans possess exclusively as a byproduct of their military service? What makes a veteran or military member that much more likely to succeed in life after separation? Leadership at every level. At age 19, I was put in charge of $6 million of government equipment. I had colleagues in their 20s who were appointed interim governors of entire towns in the Middle East. There is no better 
anvil on the planet to forge a 21st century leader than where you are right now. Hands down, that's it. Building world-class leaders is what we do. It's in our DNA. It's who we are in our profession of arms. Are there good leaders outside of the U.S. military experience? Of course there are. But I would argue that they're fewer and farther between. Next, composure and creativity under extreme pressure. You guys may have just seen this, but it's a perfect example of creativity under pressure. The Air Force Times just reported on a story of an F-16 that had a malfunction where he couldn't sustain more than 500 pounds of fuel at a time. He was going to have to eject over ISIS-controlled territory. <laughs> now, I was in the infantry and then I was a maintainer. Uh, so I don't know what's in the mind of a pilot, but in my mind, there are very few things that a fighter pilot fears. Ejecting over ISIS territory is one of them. So a KC-135 tanker stepped up and escorted the Falcon back to base while refueling him every 15 minutes. This is the very definition of composure and creativity under pressure. And there are hundreds of examples of this happening every day in the U.S. military. And in society, as entrepreneurs in particular, I've seen veterans go well beyond the stress point at which their civilian counterparts would break under the pressure. Integrity first. I got some flack for this because integrity first should technically be the first slide and here's the third. All right, veterans in the civilian world operate at a higher level of integrity in all interactions. When I worked for this large German medical company, we had a device called a head fixation device, and it held a patient's head completely motionless. In this case, a child. It screwed into the child's skull and held the child's head completely motionless so that the doctor could extract a a brain tumor. If the head were to move, it could be fatal for the child. So my team found a defect with this head fixation device. We took it to our CEO, a lovely man, and he said, Wes, the chances of it failing are extremely low and it's going to cost us millions to recall. So we're not going to do it. We're not going to recall it. I left the company about a week later. Veterans understand integrity and you can trust them to do the right thing even when no one is looking. I'm not saying every veteran or airman for that matter is a saint. Obviously any group is going to have its individuals that don't reflect the best qualities of the group proper. But by and large, in my personal dealings with veterans in business, I've seen men and women who operate out of a clear sense of right and wrong and service before self. This translates in business to a happier and more productive workforce, which in turn results more and more revenue. Habitual goal orientation. So any so-called success guru will talk to you about the importance of setting goals. A goal must require you to take action, not reaction. And massive action gets massive results. Military members equate competence, task orientation, and a positive attitude as essential to achieving military goals. Then they leave the military and they bring this mindset with them into the civilian world. Another thing veterans bring is something called the AAR, After Action Report. In the Air Force, it's called the debrief. Let's talk about that last mission. What went wrong? What went right? How can we improve performance for the next mission? You'd be amazed at how many companies, Fortune 500 companies, that aren't using this positive feedback loop of the debrief. Bring that with you to the civilian world. My favorite, 
diversity and inclusion in action. In 1965, a black U.S. Army soldier named Milton Olive III was on patrol with his squad in Vietnam. They made contact with the enemy, and as the Viet Cong turned to flee, they turned around and tossed a grenade that landed right in the middle of PFC Olive's squad. PFC Olive nonchalantly said, I got it reached down, picked up the grenade, tucked it into his chest, and laid down on it. PFC Olive was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. In jumping on that grenade, he saved the lives of his squad, both black men and white men, and in doing so, showed us how we ought to live. Now, America has been called a melting pot because of the many different nationalities and religions and ethnicities that make up this great country. But melting pot means everything becomes a homogenous goo. Everything becomes uniform, the same color, the same consistency. I don't like melting pot. I like to think of America as sort of like a delicious chef's salad. Right, where you have all of these different ingredients, right? You have these tomatoes and maybe a little chicken, lettuce, and everything has a very distinct flavor, but it all comes together to make this delicious whole. Make absolutely no mistake, America is powerful because of its diversity. Don't ever let anybody tell you that it's not. Different people bring a wealth of different experiences that help us adapt to a world where the challenges can be overwhelming. And soldiers, sailors, airmen and marines know better than anyone that mission accomplishment doesn't care about race, religion, or gender. So what are we seeing today? What does the civilian landscape look like now that we're seeing this massive influx of post 9-11 veterans? So after I left this German medical company, I started my own business, MD Advantages Healthcare. And I had this big idea that I wanted to create a modular medical cart. You see, I saw a problem when I was in and out of all these hospitals with my old company. I saw that doctors and nurses would spend, on average, 30 to 45 minutes searching the hospital for the right medical cart for a particular procedure. There was always a crash cart around, but they never had a pediatric cart, or they never had an anesthesia cart. My idea was to take a medical cart that's drawer module was completely interchangeable and you could turn a cart into whatever cart you needed very very quickly I mean 30 to 45 minutes that's time that could be better spent improving patient care so we took this back of the napkin drawing or rather back of the Microsoft paint drawing and I turned it over to a very talented individual named Ashish a friend of mine and he spit out this the Omnicart, and I apologize about the name. It's the best I could think of. And you see when you pull these handles right here, the center drawer module slides out on wheels of its own and can, can, can quickly be interchanged. Regardless of the Omnicart's success, I still wasn't happy. I wasn't, I wasn't happy in the medical business. I don't want to be in the medical business. So I opened up a furniture company called Modern Workspace. Furniture for smart people, and we sell technology furniture, much like this stuff that you're sitting at right now. It's, but I'm, the, the, I'm, I'm still not happy. I, I'm still stuck in furniture. I want to do something with the military. I want to do something with veterans. And finally, through trial and error, I created a website, thanks and help to a YouTube tutorial on how to build your own website, I created WarriorLodge.com, an online magazine for active duty veterans and people thinking about joining. And you'll see these ads here. This is supported by advertisements. And what's funny is that when you create a Facebook business page and you gather a lot of fans, every time you post something on the Facebook version of your site, revenue shoots up at the actual site you get money into your bank account. And in fact, one of the best ways that I've found, one of the best things you can post is actually memes. Like you want to start a meme war. If I can have a digression for a moment, uh, 
<laughs> so I, I'll, I'll get this. I'll get the branches fighting amongst each other. Now it's all good natured, right? We're all on the same team, but I'll get the branches fighting amongst each other. So, so <laughs> Marines after the ASVAB, and so the Marines come back with this. It's okay, Airmen. It's supposed to make that loud bang sound. And for some reason, somebody always takes a shot at the Coast Guard. Why? What did the Coast Guard ever do to anybody? Nothing in the history of military. I know they're Department of Homeland Security, but they have not... Just leave the Coast Guard alone. I live in a Coast Guard town. They're okay dudes. So another, another amazing organization is this nonprofit called Veterans in Film and Television. Is extremely interested in taking military members from any branch and connecting them with your Hollywood types. You ever want to be in TV, movies, commercials, uh, producing, writing, directing? This is a nonprofit that helps uh, facilitate your entrance into the movie business. And you can see because of my new documentary film, you see my profile here that I've created. Uh, one of the most notable examples of someone that has gone through VFT. Uh, into Hollywood here is Adam Driver, Kylo Ren in the new Star Wars, Marine Corps veteran, post 9-11 veteran. All right, next we have Grunt Style, a multi-million dollar t-shirt business started by an ex-army drill sergeant. Incredible example of veterans using those values and doing something with it as entrepreneurs. And this even works with YouTube celebrities, right? We have an ex-Army Ranger called Matt Best, who's out there entertaining the masses, making money while doing it, and using his platform to spread positive messages about veterans. What you're seeing from these successful veterans is that it's possible. Success is calling you. The profession of arms built you for success. You're made for success. Last century's old guard is dying. You've just inherited the country. What are you going to do with it? What's in your toolbox? You already have this massive head start because of the type of person that the American military makes you into. But what are some practical lessons that I can pass on to help ensure your success after you separate? Now we talked about this, but find out that thing in your life that would give you a sense of value, a full, rich life. What is it? Maybe astronaut? Own a bed and breakfast? Take that limiter off your brain and operate on the assumption that literally anything is possible. Don't sabotage yourself before you even begin. Now listen up, because this part's important. Choose your group of friends very carefully. Outside of the military, where people's pay isn't strictly defined by pay grade, what you'll find is that your salary is the average of your five closest friends. When I found that out, I started to make friends with some extremely rich people. You're going to have those people in your life that are doubters. Wait, Wes, you're going to start your own business? That's not you, man. You're going to be a speaker? They laughed at me. They're going to laugh at you, too. The bigger your dream, the harder they're going to laugh. Why? Because your success reminds them of a time that they tried and failed and didn't get back up and revisit it again. Even your friends and family will be envious of your ambition. And you need to be careful. Because you're going to have some self-doubt along the way. We all have self-doubt. Right? And the dangerous part is, is that if you have these negative people around you, telling you why something can't be done, it might confirm your own bit of self-doubt and convince you that your idea is stupid. And then 10 years down the road, you're going to see someone else making a million dollars off of your idea. And you're going to kick yourself. And you're going to say, I knew that was a good idea. And one more thing about people. If you're the smartest person in your group, you need to find a new group. When I started MD Advantages, I called a meeting of my department heads. And I said, the day I walk in here and know more than you guys, you're all fired. I guarantee they stayed ahead of me after that. You need to surround yourself with people that constantly challenge you, right? Make you stretch yourself, make you stretch your mind. It's a hollow victory to be smarter than your friends. 
So there's this man I follow on YouTube named Eric Thomas. Uh, he's a motivational speaker. He's an all-around amazing human being. And he has this incredible message about getting off average, and I have to share it, right? So Eric says, get off average. Nobody likes average. Your boss doesn't like average. Your instructors don't like average. Nobody really likes average. Success is allergic to average. Success won't have anything to do with average. So the next time you give a low effort, the next time you give a 30% effort or a 50% effort or a 70% effort, I want you to go back and think about what you were thinking about at the time you gave that low effort. And I'd be willing to bet you were thinking, I got to versus I get to. You were thinking about the obligation and not the opportunity. Yeah, but Wes, how can I find opportunity in homework? You have to become the type of person that finds opportunity in everything, right? If you don't see opportunity, opportunity isn't something that comes around once in your life and you're lucky if you grab it. You create opportunity. Nobody's given you any. You create it. Yeah, but Wes, that sounds all well and good. That sounds like some awesome motivational hype. But how? How do you create opportunity? Let me give you an example. I always wanted to speak at TED. I have something to talk about. I'm a professor of predictive analytics. I want to say data is beautiful, right? Data will save the world. Information visualization. I have a subject I want to talk about at TED. I found out the TED people were coming to Grand Rapids to give a speech about why TED is great for the community. And they were coming to speak at a Rotary Club meeting. So I went and I snuck into this Rotary Club meeting and I put a name tag on. Like I belong there. I wrote my name, Wes, stuck it on my chest, went out and uh, sat down with making small talk. People were like, you oh, know, hey, who are you? Well, I'm Wes. I'm kind of new here. Uh, I wasn't lying. I was new here. <laughs> and um, I sat down and made small talk. I had lunch and I sat politely through this TED presentation. And at the end of the Rotary Club meeting, I went up to the TED people and I said, hey, I want to speak at TED. And they said, Sure come on by the office and give us your pitch. And if it's good enough, you can speak at TED. I want you to start looking at life as this massive maze full of death traps, dead ends. And you know what? Through this maze, there are only a couple of different paths to success, right? You might spend a decade of your life bumping into a dead end, spending $10,000 where you don't need to be spending money. This is why I advocate the importance of a mentor. You have to find that person that's doing the thing that you want to do. And you have to ask them. And you have to walk up and you have to say, I want to do what you're doing. Will you mentor me? Because you know what? That mentor has been through the maze. That mentor knows the exact path to success. They can save you years. They can guide you along the way. I want to design and patent a modular medical cart. Well, how the hell do you do that? I want to sell to the government so it's in VA and military hospitals. How do you do that? Who has done that before? Identify that person and ask. And it might be intimidating to you, but if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Or as my mom used to say, a closed mouth never gets fed. I cannot stress enough the importance of a mentor. A mentor will give you that crucial confidence to aim high and bury your self-doubt. And talking about aiming high, when you're working on your goals, I want you to aim high, right? Most people fail at life not because they aim too high and miss, but because they aim too low and hit. Or as Les Brown says, shoot for the moon, because even if you miss, you'll be out among the stars. Now, I made a promise to myself 20 years ago, and I've never shared this with anybody, except my wife. You guys are going to be the first. I promised myself that I would run for president and win in 2032. When I told my wife this 20 years ago, she didn't laugh, as one would expect. She kept a straight face, and she looked me in the eye, and she said, I believe you. Wes is more, 2032, that's right. So what happens if I don't get elected president? What happens? 
Imagine what I will have accomplished in my life trying for that goal. Military veteran. I want to serve my country. Military veteran. I want to own a business. Business owner. Speaker. Professor. What's next? Senator. I, every, sing, every, every, every goal that I have in my life, every, every stepping stone in my life is getting me closer to 2032 and that presidential nomination. Who cares if I'm not elected president in 2032? Imagine what I will have accomplished along the way. Aim high. There is no downside. Oh, and uh, vote for West, 2032. And the most important key for all of veteran success is that you got to want it. I mean, you got to want it bad. And going back to Eric Thomas, he tells us this great story about this success guru that came to speak to a crowd in Michigan. And this guru came in and gave his speech. And after the speech was over, this guy walks up and says, Hey, guru, I want to be just like you. Tell me the secret to success. Tell me the key to success. And the guru said, I'll tell you what. Meet me at the shore of Lake Michigan at 4 a.m. tomorrow morning, and I'll give you the key to success. I'll tell you the secret. So, sure enough, shows up at 4 a.m. and he sees the guru standing there on the beach. And the guru says, okay, come out with me into the water. Water? Um, we'll say, do you want to be successful or not? He said, well, yeah, I want to be successful. Okay, come with me into the water. So they both start walking out. The water gets about knee deep. And the guy says, yeah, I really don't know what this has to do with success. And he says, follow me if you want to be successful. And they keep walking out. And the water is about waist deep. And as they keep walking, when the water gets to about neck deep, the guru grabs the man and plunges him underwater. And he holds him there. And he's holding him there for about a minute. And the man starts to tremble and shake. And he starts to try and claw his way back up. But the guru is strong. And he's holding him underwater. Another minute passes by. And finally, the guru thrusts him up out of the water and says, Quick, what were you thinking just now? What did you want more than anything else in life? And the man says, breathe. I just wanted to breathe. And the guru says, when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you will be successful. You got to want it. Championships aren't won in the theater of the arena. Success is born in the 5 a.m. runs, in the library studying at 2 a.m., I'll study as long as it takes. I'll do as many push-ups as it takes, as many reps as it takes. I'll pay whatever the price is. And most people won't make those sacrifices now to get that reward later. They won't do it. Why? People are soft. This is a soft generation out here. They aren't willing to give away that comfort right now for more comfort later. You have to be willing to live like most people won't so that you can someday live like most people can't. All right, let's switch gears real quick and talk about failure. And we talk about failure, especially in the profession of arms. We say failure is not an option. Failure in our job, failure in our job as military members might mean mission failure and the loss of our lives, our allies' lives, possibly civilians. And society reflects this, right? We hate it when our sports team loses. If we fail a class, we have to repeat it. But in my world, in the world of entrepreneurship, this thinking is so dangerous. It's because of this allergy to failure that people who decide to follow their dreams and pursue their big ideas actually give up and walk away when they do fail. So I want you to do me a favor. I'm not asking that you get comfortable with failure. All I'm asking is that you start to look at it as if it's a positive. Just because you fail doesn't make you a failure. A lot of people think that failure is a step backwards. No, 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 no. Failure is a step forward, a step in the right direction. Every time you fail, you learn something from it. You gain something from it. You feel less anxiety about it when you're doing it again. As Greg Plitt says, as, a, as the late Greg Plitt says, a lot of people think that failure is a step backwards. No, 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 no. Failure is a step forward, a step in the right direction. Every time you fail, you learn something from it. You gain something from it. You feel less anxiety about it when you're doing it again. That's progress in every sense of the word, my friends. Failure is part of the process in entrepreneurship. Nobody ever tells you this, but you're supposed to fail. 
you are supposed to fail. All roads to success, you got to go through failure and pain to get there. It's supposed to be hard. As the saying goes, if it was easy, everybody would do it. It has to be hard. It's supposed to be hard. That's what weeds out 97% of the population. I never told anybody this, but I got to a point in my first startup where I hit bottom. You have to understand that entrepreneurship is this insane roller coaster of extreme highs and extreme lows. Uh, we just got a new round of funding, extreme high. We haven't had a sale in six months, extreme low. And you have to be the type of person that can stomach that roller coaster. I got to a point where I realized I had left my six-figure corporate job and taken my family from a life of comfort to a life below the poverty line. A wife and three kids. I screwed them over. I took them. I made a gamble on myself and in the process took them and changed their lifestyle from comfort to misery. And at this time, I wasn't seeing any results, right? I wasn't seeing any, uh, anything that even remotely resembled success. He hadn't had a sale in months. Bill collectors were calling. Credit was going down the drain. And I actually concocted a plan to get in my car and drive it off of a bridge and make it look like an accident so that my family would still get the life insurance payout and they'd be all set. This is the low that I'm talking about. It can get brutal. It can get hard. But you have to say, you know what? Maybe tomorrow is the day. Maybe it's tomorrow when that deal goes through. Maybe it's tomorrow when that funding comes in. Maybe it's tomorrow that I meet that one person that decides to invest or that one person that can take my company to the next level. Maybe it's tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow is the day. What if I give up today and tomorrow would have been the day? It's supposed to be hard. That's what separates us from the other 97% that lives their life at the status quo, that is comfortable with average. Now, you're going to have some ups and you're going to have some downs. Anybody can feel good when they have their health, their bills are paid, they're in happy relationships. Anybody can be positive then. Anybody can have a larger vision then. Anybody can have faith under those types of circumstances. The real challenge of growth, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, comes when you get knocked down. It takes courage to get back up after life punches you in the face. As my mentor, Les Brown, says, you want it, and you're going to go all out to have it. It's not going to be easy. When you want to change, if it were in fact easy, everybody would do it. But if you're serious, you'll go all out. I'm in control here. You have got to make a declaration that this is what you stand for. You're standing up for your dreams. You're standing up for peace of mind. You're standing up for your character. Take full responsibility for your life. Accept where you are and the responsibility that you're going to take yourself where you want to go. Live your life with passion, with some drive. Decide that you're going to push yourself. The last chapter to your life has not been written yet, and it doesn't matter what happened yesterday. What matters is, what are you going to do today? Today, I'm going to make this decade my decade. I won't talk about it anymore. Anybody can start something. You, my friends, have already started on this amazing journey. The question is, how are you going to finish? Live the values from the profession of arms. Take those values with you from the Air Force to civilian life and leave your mark on the world. Thank you very much.